So I'm going to talk for about an hour, so relax. I just start out, the name of my talk is The Gentrification of AIDS. And I'm going to start with a quote from Milan Kundera, who said, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around will forget even faster. What are the consequences of AIDS? Recently, I was invited to Hartford, Connecticut, one of the poorest cities in the United States, to speak to an organization for women with AIDS. The HIV-positive women in the audience are mostly black and Latin, and like every other person with AIDS, they had become infected through injection, drug use, or unsafe sex with infected partners. Now they were students, community workers, safe sex educators, peer counselors. Many described themselves to me as activists, but actually they were working for social service agencies or part of AIDS bureaucracies. The distinction between service provision and activism had become elusive. Poor people are very interwoven into state agencies. There's a lot of surveillance and intersection. My life has shown me that activists win policy changes and bureaucracies implement them. When we find ourselves in a period like the present where there's no real activism, there are only bureaucracies. So when there are severe budget cuts, lack of jobs, lack of educational opportunities, foreclosures, there are no structures in place radical enough to be able to mobilize people to respond effectively. These women were under siege by US government policies but had no political movement, only a social service sector to occupy. My talk was about the history of the women with AIDS empowerment movement. I read them a piece I had published 23 years before in the Village Voice about women being ex excluded from experimental drug trials. The article included quotes from interviews with pharmaceutical executives about how unreliable women were, not dependable like art professionals. That was their euphemism for gay men. <laughs> I then showed a 16-minute excerpt of Jim Hubbard's film, United in Anger, about ACT UP's four-year campaign to change the Center for Disease Control's definition of AIDS so that women could get benefits. The film showed the early leaders of the women with AIDS movement, black and Latin women, just like those in the audience. Ex-prisoners, ex and ongoing addicts, ex-prostitutes, now leading a political movement, literally yelling and screaming in the rain in front of government buildings, demanding policy changes. Jim had superimposed the birth dates and death dates under the name of each activist, so it quickly became clear that all of these leaders had died. When the lights came up, there was a kind of stunned silence. Quickly, I heard from many women in the audience that they had no idea that any of this had ever happened. They did not know that women were ever excluded from treatment. They did not know that women could not get benefits. And most importantly, they did not know that women exactly like themselves had been leaders and activists, forcing government agencies to change their policies. Even though they were currently underserved, losing benefits through budget cuts, and in desperate need of an activist movement for poor people in America, they did not know their own legacy of leadership. They did not know that they could change the world, and that people in exactly their circumstance had already done so. On the way home, these images were reeling in my mind. The truth of complexity, empowerment, the agency of the oppressed, replaced by an acceptance of banality, a concept of self based falsely in passivity, an inability to realize one's self as a powerful instigator and agent of profound social change. What is this process? What is this thing called that homogenizes complexity, difference, dynamic dialogic action for change, and replaces it with sameness? with a kind of institu institutionalization of culture, with a lack of demand on the powers that be, with containment. My answer to that question always came back to the same concept, gentrification. 
Now first I need to define my terms. To me, the literal experience of gentrification is a concrete replacement process. Physically, it is an urban phenomena, the removal of communities of diverse classes, ethnicities, races, sexualities, languages, and points of view from the central neighborhoods of cities, and their replacement by more homogenized groups. With this comes the destruction of culture and relationship, and this destruction has profound consequences for the future lives of cities. But in the case of my particular question, while literal gentrification was very important to what I was observing, there was also a spiritual gentrification that was affecting people who did not have rights, who were not represented, who did not have power, or even consciousness about the reality of their own condition. There was a gentrification of the mind, an internal replacement that alienated people from the concrete process of social and artistic change. I want to articulate tonight how the unexplored consequences of AIDS and the literal gentrification of cities has created a diminished consciousness about how political and artistic change gets made. Part one, the dynamics of death and replacement. We could argue about which American cities are the most gentrified, but high up on everyone's list would be New York and San Francisco. The most gentrified neighborhoods of Manhattan, East Village, West Village, Lower East Side, Harlem, and Chelsea. The National Research Council's 1993 report on the social impact of AIDS recorded Manhattan's highest rates of infection in Chelsea, Lower East Side, East Village, Greenwich Village, and Harlem, as compared to, for example, the Upper East Side. As soon as the question is posed, one thing at least becomes evident. Cities and neighborhoods with high AIDS rates have experienced profound gentrification. By 2008, 22% of Harlem's new residents were white. By 2009, the average household income in Chelsea was $176,000 a year. By 2010, the median housing sales price in the West Village was $1.9 million, even with the crash of the credit markets. The East Village has one of the lowest foreclosure rates in New York City. How did this relationship between AIDS and gentrification come to be? Now, after World War II, the GI Bill pro provided great impetus for urban ethnic whites to move to newly developed moderate income suburbs outside of the city. The bill provided low interest loans for veterans that made home ownership possible for the first time. And racist housing policies often de facto restricted these benefits to white families. This period, which is often known as white flight, recontextualized many white families into privatized suburban lifestyles with a much higher rate of gender conformity, class conformity, compulsory heterosexuality, racial segregation, and homogenous cultural experience than that they had known in the city. Built into this was an increased fear or alienation from urban culture, from multiculturalism, from gender nonconformity and individuated behavior. Innovative aesthetics, diverse food traditions, new innovations in arts and entertainment, new discoveries in music, ease with mixed race and mixed religious communities, free sexual expression and political radicalism, all of these were often unknown, separate from or considered antithetical to suburban experience. An emphasis on new consumer products, car culture, and home ownership itself formed the foundation of values that cemented many communities' ethical systems. In the 1970s, New York City faced bankruptcy. The poor, working class, and middle class residents simply did not provide a wide enough tax base to support the city's infrastructure. It was a place of low rents, open neighborhoods. I just want to say that my parents uh, paid $60 a month rent, and they got three months free rent for signing their lease. Um, and it was a place of mixed cultures. City policy began to be developed with the stated goal of attracting wealthier people back to the city to be able to pay the municipal bills. 
However, now, in 2012, the city is overflowing with rich people and continues to close hospitals, eliminate bus lines, and fire teachers. So the excuse presented for gentrification 40 years ago is revealed by historic reality to have been a lie. We now know that real estate profit was the motive for these policies. Tax breaks were deliberately put in place to attract real estate developers to convert low-income housing to condominiums and luxury rentals to attract high-income tenants. Does this sound familiar, Vancouver? (laughs) Among those most responsive to the new developments were the children of white flight, those who had grown up in the suburbs with a nostalgic or sentimental familial attachment to the city the place where they had gone to visit their grandmother or to go to the theater or as teenagers to take the commuter train and walk around and smoke pot in the village. It's not a conspiracy, but simply a tragic example of historic coincidence that in the middle of this process of converting low-income housing into housing for the wealthy, in 1981, to be precise, the AIDS epidemic began. Now, in my neighborhood, Manhattan's East Village, Over the course of the 1980s, real estate conversion was already dramatically underway when the epidemic peaked and large numbers of my neighbors started dying, turning over their apartments literally to market rate at unnatural speed. As I watched my neighborhood transform, it was quickly apparent that the newly rehabbed units attracted a different kind of person than the ones who had been displaced and freshly died. Instead of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Eastern European and Italian immigrants, lesbians, non-institutionalized artists, gay men and other sexually adventurous and socially marginalized refugees from uncomprehending backgrounds living on economic margins in an economy where that was possible, these replacement tenants were much more identified with the social structures necessary to afford newly inflated mortgages and rents. That is to say, they were more likely to be professionalized, to be employed in traditional ways by institutions with economic power and social recognition, to identify with those institutions, to come from wealthier families, and to have more financial support from those families. So the appearance and rapid spread of AIDS and consequential death rates coincidentally enhanced the gentrification process that was already underway. The process of replacement was so mechanical, I could literally sit on my stoop and watch it unfurl. The replacement tenants had a culture of real privilege that they carried with them, and I know that's a word that is bandied about and can be applied too easily in many arenas, but what I mean in the case of the gentrifiers is that they were privileged in that they did not have to be aware of their power or of the ways in which it was constructed. They instead saw their dominance as simultaneously non-existent and the natural deserving order. This is the essence of supremacy ideology. The self-deceived pretense that one's power is acquired by being deserved and has no machinery of enforcement. And then these privileged, who the entire society is constructed to propel, unlearn that those earlier communities ever existed. They replace the history and experience of their neighborhood's former residents with a distorted sense of themselves as timeless. That those people lost their homes and died is pretended away, and reality is replaced with a false story in which the gentrifiers have no structure to impose their privilege. They just naturally and neutrally earned and deserved it. And in fact, the privilege does not even exist. That in fact, if you attempt to identify the privilege, you are politically correct or oppressing them with reverse racism or other non-existent excuses that the powerful invoke to feel weak in order to avoid accountability. Gentrification is a process that hides the apparatus of domination from the dominant themselves. Now, spiritually, gentrification is the removal of the dynamic mix that defines urbanity, the familiar interaction of different kinds of people creating ideas together. Urbanity is what makes cities great because the daily affirmation that people from other experiences are real makes innovative solutions and experiments possible. 
In this way, cities historically have provided acceptance, opportunity, and a place to create ideas contributing to freedom. Gentrification in the 70s, 80s, and 90s replaced urbanity with, a, with suburban values from the 60s and 70s, so that the suburban conditioning of racial and class stratification, homogeneity of consumption, mass-produced aesthetics, and familial privatization got resituated into big buildings, attached residences, and apartments. This undermines urbanity and recreates cities as centers of obedience instead of as instigators of positive change. Just as gentrification literally replaces mix with homogeneity, it enforces itself through the repression of diverse expression. This is why we see so much quashing of public life as neighborhoods gentrify. Permits become required for performing, for demonstrating, for dancing in bars, for playing musical instruments on the street, for selling food, for painting murals, selling art, drinking beer on the stoop, and there are crackdowns on smoking pot or cigarettes. Evicting four apartments and replacing them with one loft becomes reasonable and then desirable instead of antisocial and cruel. Endless campaigns against cruising and public sex harass citizens. The relaxed nature of neighborhood living becomes threatening, something to be eradicated and controlled. Since the mirror of gentrification is representation in popular culture, increasingly only the gentrified get their stories told in mass ways. They look in the mirror and think, it's a window, believing that <laughs> Corporate support for and inflation of their story is in fact a neutral and accurate picture of the world. If all art, politics, entertainment, relationships, and conversations must maintain that what is constructed and imposed by force is actually natural and neutral, then the gentrified mind is a very fragile parasite indeed. Now, of course, New York relies on new voices and visions. All cities do. Our soul has always been fed by new arrivals from other countries and from around the U.S. who enrich and deepen our city. New York has also always been a utopian destination as well for heartland whites who were ostracized or punished in their conforming hometowns. Individu individuated young people came to New York to make it, to come out, to be artists, to make money, to have more sophisticated experiences, to have sex, to escape religion, and to be independent of their families. No one is inherently problematic as a city dweller because of his or her race or class. It's the ideology with which one lives that creates the consequences of one's actions on others. Many whites over the centuries have come to New York explicitly to discover and live the dynamic value of individuality in sync with community, instead of simply parroting the way their parents and neighbors lived in their place of birth. As artist Penny Arcade wrote in her 1996 performance piece, New York Values, quote, Bohemia has nothing to do with poverty or with wealth. It is a value system that is not based on materialism. There are people who go to work every day in a suit and tie who are bohemian and will never have a bourgeois mentality like the loads of people who graduate from art school and are completely bourgeois. <laughs> there is a gentrification that happens to buildings and neighborhoods and there is a gentrification that happens to ideas." End quote. The difference between the refusenik Americans of the past and the ones who created gentrification culture is that in the past, Young whites have come to New York to become New Yorkers. They became citified and adjusted to the differences and dynamics they craved. This new crew, the professionalized children of the suburbs, were different. They came not to join or to blend in or to learn and evolve, but to homogenize. And I want to say that it's the invention of the suburbs that produced this phenomena. It had never existed before. They brought the values of the gated community and a willingness to trade freedom for security. For example, neighborhoods became defined as good because they were moving towards homogeneity, or safe because they became dangerous to the original inhabitants. 
fearful of other people who did not have the privileges that they enjoyed, gentrifiers, without awareness of what they were doing, sought a comfort in overpowering the natives rather than becoming them. Now, there's a weird passivity that accompanies gentrification. I find that in my own building, the old tenants who pay lower rents are much more willing to organize for services, to object when there are rodents or no lights in the hallways. We put up signs in the lobby asking the new neighbors to phone the landlord and complain about mice. But the gentrified tenants are most completely unwilling to make demands for basics. They do not have a culture of protest even if they're paying $2,800 a month for a tenement walk-up apartment with no closets. It's like a hypnotic identification with authority. Or maybe they think they're only passing through. Or maybe they think they're slumming. But they do not want to ask authority to be accountable. It's not only the city that has changed, but the way its inhabitants conceptualize themselves. Now looking back, When gentrification first started, we really did not understand what was happening. I recall thinking or hearing that these changes were natural. You know, they always naturalize these things, right? And that these were evolution or progress. Some people blamed artists, even though artists had lived in this neighborhood for over 150 years. The theory behind blaming the artists was a feeling that somehow their long-standing presence had suddenly made the area attractive to bourgeois whites who worked on Wall Street. At the time, there was no widespread understanding of how deliberate policies, tax credits, policing strategies, and moratoriums on low-income housing were creating this outcome. In 1988, Manhattan was 47% white. By 2009, it was 57% white an unnaturally dramatic transformation over a short period of time. But these statistics don't really tell the story. My anecdotal lived experience tells me that surveys don't tell us what white means. There's a difference to the life of a city between low-income, marginalized whites moving into integrated neighborhoods to become part of that neighborhood versus a moneyed, dominant culture white person moving to change a neighborhood. Does white mean working class Italians, new immigrants from Eastern Europe, low income artists, low income students, low income homosexuals who are out of the closet and don't want to be harassed? Or does it mean whites who are speculators, who come to work in the financial industry to profit from globalization or who live on income other than what they earn? Part two, the gentrification of AIDS. Key to the gentrification mentality is the replacement of complex realities with simplistic ones. Mixed neighborhoods become homogenous. Mixed neighborhoods create public simultaneous thinking, many perspectives converging on the same moment at the same time in front of each other. Many languages, many cultures, many racial and class experiences taking place on the same block in the same building. Homogenous neighborhoods erase this dynamic and are much more vulnerable to enforcement of conformity. AIDS, which emerged as gentrification was underway, is an arena where simple answers to complex questions have ruled. Keep it simple only works if you're an alcoholic who doesn't want to take another drink. But in all other areas of life, complexity is where truth lies. AIDS has been bombarded by simplification since its beginning. The people who have it don't matter. It's their fault. It's over now. Easy to blame AIDS on the infected and much more difficult to take in all of the social, economic, epidemiological, sexual, emotional, and political questions. Even treatments have turned out to be combination medications, not a single pill that just makes AIDS go away. The relationship of gay men to gentrification is particularly interesting and complex. It's clear to me, although rarely stated, that the high rate of deaths from AIDS was one of a number of determining factors in the rapid gentrification of key neighborhoods of Manhattan. From the first years of the epidemic through to the epicenter of the AIDS crisis, people I knew were literally dying daily, weekly, regularly. Sometimes they left their apartments and went back to their hometowns to die because there was no medical support structure and their families would take them. Many, however, were abandoned by their families. Sometimes they were too sick to live alone or to pay their rent and left their apartments to die on friends' couches or in hospital corridors. Many died in their apartment. It was normal to hear that someone we knew had died and their belongings were thrown out on the street. 
I remember once seeing a carton of a lifetime collection of playbills in a dumpster in front of a tenement, and I knew that it meant that another gay man had died of AIDS, his belongings dumped in the gutter. In the early years, people with AIDS had no protection of any kind. Homosexuality itself was still illegal, and sodomy laws would not be repealed until 2003. There was no anti-discrimination legislation, and of course in the United States there still isn't uh, federal anti-discrimination legislation. At that time, there was no gay rights bill in New York City. There were no benefits. There was no qualifying for insurance or social services. There were no treatments. Particularly gruesome was that surviving partners or roommates were not allowed to inherit, inherit leases that had been in the dead person's name. And this policy was also true in public housing projects as well as in private rentals. So for every leaseholder who died of AIDS, an apartment went to market rate. While of course AIDS devastated a wealthy subculture of gay white males, many of the gay men who died of AIDS in my neighborhood were either from the neighborhood originally and or risk-taking individuals living in oppositional subcultures creating new ideas about sexuality, art, and social justice. They often paid a high financial price for being out of the closet, community-oriented, and pioneering new art ideas. Indeed, many significant figures in the history of AIDS, like iconic film theorist and West Village resident Vito Russo, died without health insurance. So the apartments they left were often at pre-gentrification rates and then subjected to dramatic increases or privatized. For example, in my own building, our neighbor in apartment eight, John Hetwar, a young dancer, died of AIDS after our tenants association had won a four-year rent strike. That resulted in across-the-board rent reduction. After his death, his apartment went from $305 a month to market rate of $1,200 a month. This acceleration of the conversion process helped turn the East Village from an interracial enclave of immigrants, artists, and longtime residents to a destination location for wealthy diners and a drinking spot for Midtown and Wall Street businessmen. Avenue A went from being the centerpiece of a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood to the New York version of Bourbon Street in less than a decade. I similar, similarly observed the West Village change from a longtime Italian and gay neighborhood with an active gay street life into a new neighborhood dominated by wealthy heterosexuals and then in turn by movie stars as new gay arrivals shifted to other parts of the city. Now you have to be Julianne Moore to live in the West Village. The remaining older gay population is so elite as to have an antagonistic relationship with the young black and Latino gay men and lesbians and transgender kids who socialize on the streets and piers of the West Village. Organizations like FIERCE, Fabulous Independent Educated Radicals for Community Empowerment, had to be formed to combat harassment of young gay kids of color by wealthy white West Villagers. Gay life is now expected to take place in private in the West Village by people who are white, upper class, and sexually discreet. Now strangely, this relationship between huge death rates and an epidemic caused by governmental and familial neglect and the material, material process of gentrification are rarely recognized. Instead, gentrification is blamed on gay people and on artists who lived, not on those who caused their deaths. We all know about white gay men coming into poor ethnic neighborhoods and serving as economic shock troops, buying and rehabbing properties, bringing in elite businesses, and thereby driving out indigenous communities causing homelessness and cultural erasure. And while the racism of many white gay men and their willingness to displace poor communities in order to create their own enclaves is historical fact, Gentrification would not have been possible without tax incentives to luxury developers and the lack of city-sponsored low-income housing. That the creation of economically independent gay development is seen as the cause of gentrification is an illusion. We need to apply simultaneous thinking to have a more truthful understanding of the role of white gay men in gentrification. It is true that like many white people, many white gay men had a colonial attitude towards communities of color. Yet at the same time, it's helpful to think about why white gay men left their neighborhoods and homes to recreate themselves in black, Latino, Asian, and mixed neighborhoods. It seems clear that heterosexual dominance within every community 
does not aid and facilitate gay comfort, visibility, and autonomy. The desire to live in or to create a gay neighborhood or enclave was a consequence of oppression experiences. Only gay people who were able to access enough money to separate from their oppressive communities of origin were able to create visible gay-friendly housing and commerce and achieve political power in a city driven by real estate development. This does not excuse or negate the racism or the consequences of that racism, and these observations in no way negate gays and lesbians of color living successfully and unsuccessfully in black, Latino, Asian, and mixed neighborhoods. But if all gays could live safely and openly in their communities of origin, and if the government policies have been oriented towards protecting poor neighborhoods by rehabbing without displacement, then gentrification by white gay men would have been both unnecessary and impossible. It's crucial at this point to understand how overt and vulgar the oppression against gay people was at that time. There was not even a basic anti-discrimination bill in New York City until 1986. I remember being on a date with a woman at a restaurant called Kenny's Castaways on Bleecker Street, circa 1980. We were kissing at the table and the waitress came over with a distressed expression. I don't know how to tell you this, she said, but the manager says you're gonna have to leave. And we had to leave. In the same period, 1979 to 82, I was with a group of lesbians at a Mexican restaurant called Pancho Villa on pre-gentrification Broadway and 9th Street, and we were sitting on each other's laps, and again, we were told to leave. It was perfectly legal to den deny public accommodations, restaurants, and hotels to gay people. And these events both took place in Greenwich Village. It took the disaster of the AIDS crisis for New York queers to win the right to legally kiss in a restaurant unmolested. So this helps us understand how the implementation of gentrification policy could have been invisible to the average New Yorker, while the presence of openly gay men rehabbing a building was extremely visible. Now, although I've spent 30 years of my life writing about the heroism of gay men, I've also come to understand their particular brand of cowardice. There's a destructive impulse inside some gay men where they become cruel or childlike out of a rage about not having the privileges that straight men of our race take for granted. They have grief about not being able to subjugate everyone else at will. <laughs> you know, sometimes this gets expressed in a grandiose capitulation to the powers that be, even at the expense of their own community. For example, Professor John Boswell stopped the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies from coming to Yale because he insisted that the board be composed entirely of full professors in an era in which there were no, that is to say zero, out of the closet lesbian or non-white gay full professors in the United States. Uh, the, the center, CLAGS, refused and was moved by its founder, Martin Duberman, to the public university, the City University Graduate Center. Ironically, Boswell died of AIDS, abandoned by the social system he so strongly defended. Or Daryl Yates Rist, who wrote a piece condemning ACT UP in The Nation magazine for being, quote, obsessed with AIDS, of which he, too, later died. Media pundit Andrew Sullivan produced one of the lowest moments in AIDS coverage, one we're still paying for, when he claimed in the New York Times Magazine on November 10th, 1996, that we had reached, quote, the end of AIDS. No lie was more dear to the dominant culture than that AIDS is over, for from the moment that the New York Times told us that AIDS is over, even though it was and is a phenomena so broad and vast as to permanently transform the experience of being a person in this world, its consequences no longer needed to be considered. We still have to work every day to assert the obvious that in fact there are two distinctly different kinds of AIDS that are not over. There's AIDS of the past and there's ongoing AIDS. Neither are over, although they are treated quite differently in the present moment. Ongoing AIDS is both maintained and addressed by globalization, a sort of worldwide gentrification in which specificity of experience, understanding, and need is glossed over by a homogenizing corporate net, and existing knowledge about medicine, water, housing, food, existing methods of education, and existing international resources are denied human beings in huge numbers so that a small group of people can enjoy happiness. Those of us still living who witnessed the early days of the crisis know that had the U.S. government risen to the occasion as many of our dead begged them to do, there would not be a global epidemic today. 
As well we know that the obstacles, lack of clean water, economic underdevelopment, lack of health care, the high price of treatments, are maintained by lack of political will above all. The need for our side of the world to live off the other and maintain them in poverty, dependency, and underdevelopment is HIV's best friend. And this divide is as powerful internally to the U.S. as it is globally. The confluence of gentrification and ongoing AIDS has been a true spectacle. Marketed as AIDS in Africa, ongoing international AIDS has inspired a kind of insipid charity mentality in the citizen who expresses her opinions through the products she consumes. Gentrifying chain stores like The Gap, which have replaced many independent businesses while creating homogeneity of dress across regions, have instigated programs where purchasing a particular shirt results in a donation lower than sales tax to AIDS in Africa. Instead of sharing the world's riches, the United States has responded with programs, both governmental and corporate, that fluctuate their level of support and cease to address the underlying issues. Regarding ongoing AIDS at home, the March 15, 2009 Washington Post reported that 3 to 4 percent of Washington, D.C. is HIV infected, a higher rate than many West African countries. While death rates have declined domestically, infection rates are increasing. The failure of U.S. prevention programs to raise their percentage of effectiveness gets addressed with the gentrified cure-all, marketing, periodically changing subway ad campaigns and alternating slogans abound offering young men of color free metro cards to come to prevention counseling doesn't change the fact that they are economically, politically, and representationally pushed aside. But the larger problems, the U.S.'s refusal to destigmatize and integrate gay people on our own terms, to treat drug users effectively, to support reasonable public education, to provide health care and stop incarcerating black males, that these policies are what keeps infection rates high. As long as prevention is the American gay man's private problem, it will continue to be a public disaster. The insistence on bootstrap prevention has produced prevention campaigns for men who have sex with men because we recognize that homophobia is so punitive that we conclude that calling homosexual sex homosexual will keep people who are having homosexual sex from the support that they need to avoid HIV infection. We decide to replace truth with falsity, in other words, gentrify the truth about sex in order to save lives. Lying becomes constructed as saving, while telling the truth that men who have sex with men are having homosexual sex is assessed as ineffectual and therefore destructive because the prejudice that creates this environment is considered to be unchangeable. Yet this capitulation and therefore prolongation of homophobia has not shown statistical success in lowering infection rates. Ongoing AIDS also involves refusing to accept that education and job training that give people an interesting valued social role are the best prevention against drug abuse. That getting into effective rehab should be as easy as getting into jail. That needle exchange should be as pervasive as liquor stores. And, as Linda Villarosa pointed out in the front page of the New York Times in 2004, the lack of available partners caused by the incarceration of African-American men has created an unpartnerable generation of heterosexual black women, thereby rendering them much more vulnerable to unsafe sex and AIDS infection. Finally, ongoing AIDS means recognizing that people become infected, as Douglas Crimp said about his own seroconversion after 20 years of AIDS activism, quote, because I'm human. In this talk, I'm mostly concerned, though, with past AIDS. I'm driven by its enormous, incalculable influence in our entire cultural mindset and the parallel silence about this fact. Do you know what I mean when I refer to AIDS of the past? I'm talking about the plague. The years from 1981 to 1996, when there was a mass death experience of young people, where folks my age watched in horror as our friends, their lovers, cultural heroes, influences, buddies, as the people who witnessed our lives as we witnessed theirs, as these folks sickened and died consistently for 20 years. Have you heard about it? Amazingly, there's almost no conversation in public about these events or their consequences. 
Our friends died and our world was destroyed because of the neglect of real people who also have names and faces, whether they were politicians or parents, as people with AIDS literally fought in the streets or hid in corners until they too died or survived, and their relative neighbors, friends, co-workers, presidents, landlords, and bosses. 81,542 people have died of AIDS in New York City. These people, our friends, are rarely mentioned. Their absence is not computed, and the meaning of their loss is not considered. 1,600 people died of AIDS in New York City last year. 50% were diagnosed in the emergency room. 3,000 people died in New York City on 9-11. These people have been highly individuated. The recognition of their loss and suffering as a national ritual and the consequences of their aborted potential are assessed annually in public. They have been commemorated with memorials, organized international gestures, plaques on many fire and police stations, and a proposed new construction on the site of the World Trade Center that are designed to make their memory permanent. Money has been paid to their survivors. Their deaths were avenged with a brutal, bloody, and unjustified war against Iraq that has now caused 94,000 civilian deaths and 4,000 American military deaths. The deaths of these 81,542 New Yorkers who were despised, abandoned, and who did not have rights or representation, who died because of the neglect of their government and families, has been ignored. This gaping hole of silence has been filled by the death of 3,000 people murdered by outside forces. The disallowed grief of 20 years of AIDS deaths was replaced by ritualized and institutionalized mourning of the acceptable dead. In this way, 9-11 is the gentrification of AIDS. The replacement of deaths that don't matter with deaths that do. It is the centerpiece of supremacy ideology, the idea that one person's life is more important than another, that one person deserves rights that another does not deserve, that one person deserves representation that the other cannot be allowed to access, that one person's death is negligible if he or she was poor, a person of color, a homosexual living in a state of oppositional sexual disobedience, while another death matters because that person was a traitor, cop, or office worker, presumed to be performing the job of capital. Where are the children of people who died of AIDS? There must be hundreds of thousands of them. Most children of murdered parents coalesce into some kind of community, but not these. I fear that the descendants of people who died of AIDS do not fully understand that their parents perished because of governmental and societal neglect, not because they were gay or used drugs. As Larry Kramer said famously, where is our Nuremberg trial? Where is our catharsis? Where is our healing? Where is our post-traumatic stress? Where is our accountability? Where is our recovery? In conclusion, as we become conscious about the gentrified mind, the value of accountability must return to our vocabulary and become our greatest tactic for change. Pretending that AIDS is not happening and never happened so that we don't have to be accountable destroys our integrity and therefore our future. Ignoring that our cities cannot produce liberating ideas for the future from a place of homogeneity keeps us from being truthful about our inherent responsibilities to each other. It's cities that produce gay liberation and black power and women's liberation, not suburbs. For in the end, all this self-deception and replacing, this prioritizing and marginalizing, this smoothing over and pushing out, all of this profoundly affects how we think. That then creates what we think we feel. Thank you.